in a, a series that we are calling Strangers, Living for a Better Kingdom. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, here's the reality. You belong to a better kingdom, an unending, undivided, undefeatable kingdom. You may still have residence. You may still have citizenship in different countries on earth, but your ultimate, your first citizenship is to the kingdom of heaven. If you belong to the kingdom of heaven, you have been invited to a better kingdom and you've been invited to live a better way. In this series, in this conversation, we are trying to figure out what it looks like to live in light of that better way. But the thing we know is living in light of the kingdom of heaven is often going to clash with living in light of the kingdoms of men. It is going to feel strange to us. In fact, if it doesn't feel strange, we might be a little too comfortable in one kingdom or the other. Um, I've got to tell you, not every sermon is created emotionally equal. Some weigh a little heavier than others, as is the case um, this morning, you know, and I think some of it is honestly, I still feel like I'm suffering from a little PTSD from the, 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 the summer. You know, we had some, some hard conversations over the course of the summer, and I'm so thankful for those of you who were very honest with me about the ways those hit you, but the reality is many were not happy, and some of you folks stepped out you know, because I wasn't politically conservative enough, or I wasn't politically uh, liberal enough, or I said something that seemed a little bit too upsetting uh, to you. And uh, man, that's hard. Like I shared last week, and, and I, I, I don't take it lightly. I get up here, and I'm aware of the fact that, man, we are going to have some difficult conversations and not going to sit well like we are this morning. But I, I, so I, I want to start by just saying, please pray for me. Um, this is a little bit of an emotionally uh, challenging one on that count. It, it, it's hard. But please also hear me say it may be difficult, but it is never going to change what we say from up here. At the end of the day, Mission Point Community Church is committed to starting with the Bible and what it says. If it happens to create some discomfort, so be it. It's going to be difficult. But that is our commitment. And if it causes us to feel dissonance, then we ought to realign ourselves with what the Bible has to say. So how's that for a fun disclaimer as we get going? And uh, what we want to talk about this morning, honestly, just feels super messy to me. Not necessarily even in the emotional context or the weightiness of it. It's just so hard to describe or define. So it feels like one of those where I feel like I'm grasping to, 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 to try and figure out how to say things. So it's going to be a little messy coming out. Hey, thank you so much for your graciousness ahead of time. Okay, now I'm officially done with all disclaimers. If you have a copy of the Bible, meet me in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We are in a section of scripture called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus gave a sermon on a mountaintop in a section called the Beatitudes, the blessing declarations of Jesus for those who would follow after him and live in light of his kingdom. And we are Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. If you don't have a copy of the Bible... The verses are going to appear on the screen behind me, or if you are tuning in online, they are going to appear um, at the bottom of your screen. Here's what it says. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed, and as we said, you can feel free to replace that word with a phrase, oh, how completely happy are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meek, meek, meek. It, it, it's a tricky word to talk about, to, to define, because it's not a word we use in our everyday vocabulary. And part of that is precisely because it's a really difficult word 
to define. I feel like I need to employ my father's philosophy on discipline growing up, like I can show you better than I can tell you, you know. Um, and I'm a visual person, so it actually helps me to think about this concept of meekness in terms of pictures, in terms of stories. And I was thinking about this, uh, and, and the three stories came to mind um, to help paint a picture of meekness. It's messy. It's not easy to, to, to wrap our hands and minds around. But three stories came to mind. The first one was from my growing up. And I know I've shared this violent story with you all before, but I'm going to do it again because in my older age, I find myself repeating myself a little bit um, more. But uh, when we were kids, man, I had a bunch of friends. We always hang out in these big groups, almost like we wanted to be ready for a soccer match to break out at any given moment. Um, one of my friends um, was a guy that I'm going to call Charles. And uh, I'm not calling him Charles to you know, protect or you know, hide his identity. I'm calling him Charles because if I tell you his name from growing up, it sounds too much like an American swear word, and then I'll lose you all for a little while. So I'm just going to call him Charles for now. Charles was a massive kid. He was like a foot taller and like 12 years stronger than the rest of us. I loved to pick on Charles as much as possible. I would agitate, irritate him. I would provoke him. I would threaten him. I would call him names. I would poke him, push him, anything I could do to get under his skin. And oh, Lord forbid, some girls come and they start hanging around. I would amplify it. I would make life miserable for him. I would push him, you know, shove him and, and, and mock him and make fun of him and, 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 and pick on him. Um, and I'm not endorsing this, by the way. I'm just confessing this to you all. Um, and I would do this because I knew as massive and strong as this kid was, he was a gentle giant who would not hurt a fly, which made me feel so much, you know, better and tougher as I picked on this massive kid and he wouldn't do anything. And I remember on one occasion, I am chasing him around. He's running away. Come on, leave me alone. Stop it. Oh, stop it. And people are watching. So I feel a little bit amplified. I don't know what happened on that day. Maybe it shifted in the wind, but he stopped. So I'm poking at him and I'm pushing and I'm doing all of this stuff. And I, I don't know what happened. I still can't explain it to this day. But he said to me, pop, just like that. <laughs> and not so much here or here, right here on my lip. Pop. And I said, Poop. and naturally, I immediately reached down to start to pick up my glasses. I didn't wear glasses. He hit me so hard, I was disoriented. I didn't know where I was. We never spoke of it again. It doesn't matter. I don't even know necessarily why I'm telling you now, except for the fact that blessed are the meek. There's a story in the Old Testament about King David before he was the greatest, most legit king to ever king on earth. He was just a no-name shepherd boy who had just found out that God had chosen him to be the next ruler, the next king of his people, the Israelites. He was now anointed to be the next king of Israel. The problem was the current king Saul also found out that this no-name shepherd boy was going to take his place as the king of Israel, and he was not having it. And eventually he issued a kill order. He decided this shepherd boy must die. And this powerful king Saul went on a rampage to try and eliminate David. David found out that this powerful king Saul was going to kill him. So David went on the run as a fugitive hiding for his life. So he was living in the wild and he was sleeping in, in caves he was trying to stay off the radar. By the way, after a while, other fugitives found David and they joined him and they became this little guerrilla army, you know, rolling around in the wild somewhere. At one point, King Saul gets a drop on David's location, finds where David is, and he comes after him. He brings 3,000 of his soldiers to find and kill David on the spot. David and his men hear that Saul is coming, and so they go and they hide deep in a dark cave. Saul comes. <laughs> the Bible is so good. And at one point, 
while he's looking for David, he excuses himself from the rest of his army to go and make a poopy. And of all of the places that he could have gone, he goes into the cave in which David and his dudes are hiding and he pops a squat. David and his guys are looking like, this is the day that the Lord has made. We definitely can't hold God responsible for the smell, but this is the day that the Lord has made. David sneaks up to Saul while he's squatting down and he cuts off a slice of Saul's royal Gucci robe and then he sneaks back into the darkness and his dudes are looking at him like, what on earth, Dave? Because he was not a king at that point. It was just Dave. What on earth, Dave? This dude is threatening your life. He is trying to kill you and you have the perfect opportunity to take him down and you don't. Come on, Dave. Because blessed are the meek. David actually comes in front of Saul and he dangles the piece of his royal robe. And he says to him, I've not done anything to you. I could have taken you out and I chose not to. Please leave your boy alone. Saul says, my bad. You're a better man than I am. You're right. I'm not going to try and kill you anymore. It wasn't too long. He brings 3,000 men to try and find David again to try and kill him. This time David sneaks into the camp with Saul and his men while Saul is sleeping with his soldiers around him and he manages to take the spear that's stuck in the ground next to Saul's head, lifts that thing and then walks away. And then the next day, he holds that thing at a distance and tells Saul, we got to stop meeting like this, man. I could have killed you. But I didn't. Because blessed are the meek. There's a story in the New Testament found in Luke chapter 4. Jesus has gone 40 days and 40 nights without food. And at the end of that, he enters into one of the, you know, most epic 1v1 Jesus versus the devil battle in the desert. Satan comes after Jesus while he's most vulnerable and he takes three swings. He tempts Jesus with his best shots, takes three swings at Jesus and misses all three. Jesus just judos him with the word of God and takes Satan out. Satan exhausts himself. He fails, loses that battle, and he leaves. At the end of that little battle, that confrontation, Jesus leaves the desert and he makes his way into Galilee, into the region of Galilee. And he's walking up in there with the W, like Patrick Mahomes tonight, right? And so he's going into Galilee And here's the thing, I'll read this to you, because this is the thing Luke wants us to know uh, about Jesus as he's making his way into Galilee. This is uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 14. It says this, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. The thing Luke wants us to note about Jesus post devil butt whooping or situation in the desert is his power. Oh, there is power all over Jesus as he enters into Galilee. The power of the spirit is all over him. The power to speak galaxies into existence is on him. The power to evict demons and to heal diseases is just drenching in the stuff. The power to raise dead things to life is just clinging from Jesus. This is what Luke wants us to know. He comes into his home region in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's saying and doing things that have people absolutely mesmerized. Power. While he's there, he makes a a trip, special trip to his hometown of Nazareth because he wants them to know, hey, you got to know about this power that I am rolling with. Um, So he goes to the synagogue, to the church service. Um, Hey, y'all, it is good to be home. I just wanted you to know that you are looking at pure 
undiluted power. He reads from the, the, the Old Testament book of Isaiah and just affirms, I am the Messiah who comes with chain-breaking, prison-releasing, dead-raising power. The people are blown away. Wow! Woo! Until Jesus says some things that upset them a little bit. He says something to the effect of, hey, y'all are not, by the way, as special to God as you might think. Mm, 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 mm. This little home church situation in Nazareth gets so angry with Jesus, they turn violent. These church people, no, and I mean violent, like for real violent. It says Luke chapter 4, verse 28, look at this. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked through the crowd and went on his way. I feel like maybe a pastor watching this needs to know, hey, your ministry's not as tough as you thought. <laughs> You've probably never had that response to a sermon. Um, Jesus just faced the devil in the wilderness, and now he's in a fight with the religious in the church. They put hands on Jesus. The same hands, by the way, that hugged him as a little boy are now pushing him out of town. And it's almost as though pushing him out of town is not enough. They all agree that the best course of action is to push Jesus to the edge of a cliff and shove him off to his death. And this church crowd thinks that's the thing to do. They are that furious with Jesus. They want to kill him. And right as they think they have him, Jesus says, hey, listen, you religious folks can kill me later, but not today. And he somehow slips through the crowd and he leaves the area because blessed are the meek. Meekness is a hard word to define it feels easier at times to describe it, but let's try nonetheless. Meekness is the idea of restraint under fire. Let me push it a little bit further to drive it home. We'll put this up on the screen. Meekness is the choice to cause no harm, even when under threat or attack. Meekness. It's the choice to use zero force under fire. Whoo. That's why the word is often translated in the Bible as gentle. It, it, it's not just that the person is soft-spoken or soft-mannered. It's that the person chooses to be that way even though they are being attacked. Which is the reason I wanted to tell you these three stories of Charles, this giant of a kid who was gentle and more gentle even when he was constantly being picked on and attacked. Meekness. It's why I wanted to tell you the story of the giant slayer, David, who chose to be gentle even when his own life was being threatened, which is the reason I wanted to tell you about Jesus, who was clothed with power, but chose to use no force even when his life was being threatened because blessed are the meek and the meek are those who refuse to use force even when they are being threatened or under attack. I wonder, are you even meek? I told you this would be a tough conversation 
and we're just getting started. Because in the kingdoms of men, to refuse to use force when force is used against you, to refuse to use force under fire is to be a punk, yo. It's to be a pansy. It's to be a pushover. Matter of fact, it's to invite more problems. Someone is threatening me and attacking me and you're telling me my response ought to be gentle, use no force. Mm Mm-mm. Somebody comes at you, you come at them. Somebody threatens you, you threaten them. Somebody attacks you, you take them down. That's the way it works. In fact, to meet force with gentleness is considered weakness. But no. It's not weakness, it's meekness. Check out this picture, by the way, on the screen. Um, I think we have a photo we'll put up there. Is it up there? That's not weakness, y'all. It's meekness. There is a difference. For those of you who don't know, that is the real Clark Kent. Come on, don't give me none of this new stuff. Don't give me this Smallville, Tom Wellington, whatever. No, Christopher Reeve, there is only one Clark Kent. I'm sorry, Gersh. <laughs> Meekness. Weakness is when you have no force to use when you're under threat. This is a picture of weakness, by the way. Let's put one up. That dude. This guy is an individual by the name of George McFly. Some of you may know him from Back to the Future. That's a weak dude. He has no force to use. We can take the pictures down, by the way. You can go Google them later for yourselves. No, weakness is to have no or to have limited ability to cause harm. Weakness is when I'm threatened and I have no recourse. I have no resources to do anything to wound you or to harm you. That's when I'm weak. To be weak is to be powerless. Meekness is the opposite. In fact, meekness requires power. If you don't have power, you don't have the option to be meek. Meekness requires power. When Jesus calls his followers to be meek, he is assuming you hold the power to wound. Otherwise, meekness is meaningless. He knows you have power. He's not speaking to weak people. He's speaking to those who have power. And maybe you didn't know this, but you have power. You have so much power. Some of you have organizational power. You could never win an arm wrestle, but you hold power in your organization. Man, you can write somebody up. You can deduct their pay. You can terminate their role. Because you have power within that organization. Some of you may not have much organizational power, but you have legal power. Hey, you may have the power in this organization, but I have some legal recourse. I can sue you and make your life incredibly miserable. You have that power. Uh, Some of you have parental power. Like, hey, look, you can mouth off and say what you want, but I have the power to ground you, straight up take you out of the will, stop your college tuition payments. I have some power. That's power. And I can use that power however I want when I feel threatened or attacked. And some of you may be like, all right, well, I may not have parental power, <laughs> um, but I actually have emancipation power. There's this new thing now where if I'm not happy with you, I can file to be emancipated from you as my parents. Some of you are like, I don't need that power. I, I, maybe I can't emancipate myself, but I actually have guilting power. 
I'm not going to talk to my mom. I have the power to make her life miserable. She hates when I stop talking to her. That's power. That's power. Some of you have marital power. There's a special brand of marital power that involves cutting off. That's power. <laughs> it's apparently been used before. Um, some of you have physical power. Like, I'm just straight stronger and bigger than you. Imposing over you. Or influential power. Like, you may not be able to beat your schoolmate in an arm wrestle, but you have so much influence on campus. You have so much influence at school. Like, you can absolutely destroy them in the court of public opinion. You get enough people to just turn on them because you have influence. You have influential power in that regard. And you may not know a lawyer, but you have a concealed carry permit and you holster a deadly weapon. And you have the power to end me strapped around your ankle or your waist or wherever. Jesus says, for my followers, do not use your power or resources or recourse to harm anyone who is personally threatening or even attacking you. Don't use your power for that. We are going to need some time. And honestly, we're going to need a ton of humility to hear this. To let it affect our hearts. To let it maybe change our minds. To let it bend our wills a little bit. Because this flies in the face of the cultures of men. In fact, can I say it? For many of us, this meekness is un-American. We are already thinking about the thousand exceptions, and we'll wait, hang on a second, but what if this? We're already thinking about the list of reasons why this is just not practical. This, this church stuff, this is not practical. This flies in the face of our culture. There is no way you meet threat or force or attack with gentleness when you have the power to hit back. Mm -mm. And Jesus would say, oh, how completely happy are the people who refuse to meet fire with fire who refuse to meet threat with threat, who refuse to meet attack with attack, who refuse to meet force with force. Oh, how completely happy are the people who are determined to do no harm, even when they are being threatened. Mm. This is not easy for us if we're honest with ourselves. And I fear that the church, and particularly the church in America, is losing the war for weakness. We are leaving meekness aside because we just do not want to be the weak and so we're like, mm -mm, I don't want anything to do with that. And meekness is standing at a distance. And I think part of that is we've bought into this priority of protection philosophy. Oh, protection has become the priority. I will feel completely justified harming you with my words. Using physical force to hurt you even. As long as I'm protecting my personal, insert whatever it is we believe we're entitled to. Insert whatever it is that we feel is being threatened. Oh, if I can tell you something of mine was being threatened and I was protecting it. 
I can harm, wound, it doesn't matter, and it is justified in our culture. Mm. When someone is actively threatening your constitutional rights, it is fine to use social media to lacerate their reputation. It is fine to weaponize your words and go after them. Because after all, they're evil. After all, they are. And you are protecting a way of life and you are protecting your rights to whatever. No, do no harm with the power of your words. Oh, she knows you like him, and she's thirst trapping like that online. No, you, you, she's, she's threatening, you know, your, your, your marital prospects. You don't that, you, so you are justified to take her out. Don't mess with my love options. Make her regret it. Yeah, make her regret it. She knew you liked him. Oh, man, this administration is coming after my guns. Come and get it. Come and come try. See what happens. Come on. Come take them. And I'm telling you, in a large chunk of Midwest churches, people would say amen to that. Yeah, huh? Oh, yeah. Somebody's coming after your guns. You, you, you what? I'm curious to know. But I feel justified because I'm protecting my fill in the blank. Gondal, I was with you too. You said guns, man. You, mm. Someone's actively working to undercut your promotion opportunity at work. Or oh, I'll use my power of connections and we'll, we'll start a little alliance. And we will. We'll sprinkle crack in their car, whatever we need to do. Well, we didn't use it. We were just protecting our. Some stupid woman disrespects me in my house, threatens my masculinity. Oh, oh, I'm a let her, I'm the man in this house. I'm the man. I'm not one of these mamby pamby sissy, you know, sensitive boys without a spine. I will protect my masculinity in this house. Watch me roar. Watch me get big. Watch me. That's right, man. We've lost manhood. That's what's up. Oh, that's manhood. It's justified as long as I'm protecting my. You tell me I can't express my sexuality however I want. I'm going to flaunt it and make you as awkward as absolutely possible. Because it's my right to be whatever I... I'm going to protect my sexual rights by whatever. You're, you're right. You do you. And if someone is threatening my physical safety, who I'm putting them down. Matter of fact, there is a law to back me up. In Indiana, there's a stand your ground law. If you believe that your life is in danger or being threatened, you have the right to take someone's life, take them out. And it's legally justified because you are protecting your fill in the blank. And by the way, don't look at me like that. If you think that I'm going to get into a legal debate with you about, I'm not. I have no legal qualms. The conversation about the kingdom is not what is legally okay for you to do in this country. That's not the question. I'm not arguing with whether or not it's within your legal rights. I'm asking you, from which kingdom are you ultimately taking your cues? So you're saying you don't think it's constitution. I'm not arguing with the constitution. I'm not arguing with the law. 
I'm just saying you belong to a better kingdom with a higher law. And that's the one we ought to ultimately take our cues from. And newsflash, sometimes the higher law may clash with the law of the land. Sometimes. The point is, what is living in light of? of the kingdom look like? Yeah, Conda, I'm sorry, but I'm still stuck on, but, you know, if I'm being personally threatened or attacked, though, ooh, I'm being attacked, though, ooh, ooh, what? Meekness. Meekness is a word that means nothing until you're being attacked. Meekness is a word that means nothing until you're being threatened. Oh, Conda, but if I'm being threatened, that's the only time meekness matters. I'm with you until I'm being threatened. No, meekness requires a threat. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, Kondo. Um. Somebody comes after me, I've, I've got to, I've got to put them down, I've got to, I'm sorry. It, it's, it's, uh, um, <clears throat> what should Jesus have done in Nazareth? I'm curious to know. It is why it mattered for me to tell you, he, was, he came through dripping with power. It, it mattered for you to know that because he could have absolutely obliterated the entire little town. When you can take Satan out and you can throw galaxies into the sky with words, those people were no match for him. What should he have done? Because he was packing heat. Uh, Let me say this. I told you this would be a messy conversation, feeling our way through it. But let me say this. I think it's really important for us to remember and to realize that self-protection is not a priority in the kingdom of God. Again, our our protection priority philosophy, as long as you're protecting yourself, self-protection is actually not a priority in the kingdom of heaven. No, but somebody comes after me, then, okay, well, Jesus says a little bit further down in the same chapter, Matthew chapter 5, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which is what? You come after me, I'm coming after you. You attack me, I'm attacking you. You threaten me, I'm threatening you. Jesus says, but I tell you, you've heard it said. That's the way it maybe is dealt with there, but I tell you. Do not resist an evil person. Do not retaliate. Oh man, Jesus takes this further than I would have. Ever. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. What? By the way, Jesus is not suggesting if somebody hits you, turn and say, hey, please hit me here too. That's not the point. The point is actually Jesus saying, if somebody attacks you, do this. It's not hit me again. It is, hey, I want you to know you are getting no fight from me. I have no intention of harming you. I have no intention of hurting you. Is that This is not a call to tell people like, hey, take advantage of me. That's not the point. And let me also say this really quickly. We'll touch on this later. This is not a situation of somebody in power abusing somebody who is in lesser power. This is not an abusive situation. Jesus is assuming the person being hit has the power to hit back. So don't start reading it about what if somebody is abused. This is not that. This is talking about I have the power to hurt you back because of what you just did. But... I want you to know I have no intention 
of wounding you. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, it's like hand over your coat as well. If you can afford it, that's your way of saying, listen, man, you're not going to get me to come after you because you came after me. You're like, eh. If anyone forces you to go one mile, he says, go with them two miles. Somebody forces you to go a mile you don't want to go, it's like, you know what? Go another mile with them. Let them know. I'm not going to fight you about this. This would be a perfect opportunity for me to insert a comment about masks, but I'm not going to. I'm bigger than that. Verse 42, he says, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, please hear me say again, it is okay to leave. If somebody's bothering me, I'm going to leave. Remember that one time Jesus was being physically assaulted and he left. It's okay to get help. It's okay to call 911. <laughs> it's okay to report it. It's just not okay to attack, to use your power, to make them pay, to wound them. Okay, this is crazy. Now, by the way, I, I hope that you will sit with the words of Jesus, even here in Matthew 5, 38 through 42, like just, and just wrestle, what does he mean? And, and like legitimately, how else can you read Jesus' words? Okay, but why would anyone ever do this? Uh, a couple of things that occurred to me. One is, is the priority of love. Um, it, it, meekness actually makes sense. When we remember the first language of the kingdom of God is love. It's not self-protection. It's love. Love one another. Love your neighbor, even love your enemy. Love. And love does not lead with my rights. It leads with your best. Love does not lead with my protection. It leads with your benefit. Love. I'm constantly looking for better ways to love people, not more justifications, to stand at a distance from them and use aggression and justify it. Some of us in the church legitimately fantasize about fights with other people on the other side. And we are constantly thinking about ways to take them down and ways life could be miserable for them. Love is fantasizing about what are ways that we can show the way Jesus has loved us to them. That should be the obsession because the primary language in the kingdom of God is love. And if that's true, meekness makes absolute sense. There's nothing in me that wants to hurt you. But meekness doesn't just make sense. Because of the great command to love, meekness to me is worth it. It may seem crazy in our culture not to use force under fire, not to harm even when your rights feel threatened. But Jesus would say meekness is so worth it. You can prioritize the rights of this country and all the benefits that come from that. Or Jesus says, <laughs> you can prioritize meekness and get a country of your own. Like for real though. Look again at Matthew chapter 5 verse 5. Woo, the Bible y'all. Jesus says, oh how completely happy are the meek for they will inherit the earth. If you choose not to use your power to harm, even when you're threatened, Jesus promises that you will inherit the earth. Now, I, I just have a hard time believing that Jesus got to verse 5 and he switched over to allegories and metaphors. I don't 
think Jesus is being figurative, like, hey, girl, I'm going to give you the world. Yeah, but it's not yours to give. Question, what if it is yours to give? Because <laughs> Jesus owns the world. He can actually come through on this. When we talk about um, living forever and ever and ever and ever with Jesus, we usually talk about going to heaven and we point up. That's not entirely accurate. Our eternal home is actually going to come down. I don't know if you knew this, but we are going to spend forever and ever and ever and ever on earth a refurbished, a remodeled, a brand new earth. Woo! That's going to be good. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're someone who's committed to living life in light of his kingdom, that is your future. Jesus is like, I am going to add the earth to your inheritance packet. We are going to live on earth forever and ever and ever and ever. But I wonder if he means something a little bit more than that. Because this is crazy. Man, end times are funky. They're crazy. Um, Jesus is going to physically come back to earth. I don't know if you heard. When he does, he is actually going to rule this world for a thousand years from Jerusalem. He is going to set up camp in Jerusalem. He is going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and he's going to rule this world for a thousand years. Or read the end of Revelation. Things get good. Like 2020, eh, but Revelation 20, eh. <laughs> Uh, Satan, he's going to be on a, a thousand year timeout. <laughs> he's not going to be able to bother people. He's not going to be able to deceive the nations. This is a thousand year period in which you're going to hear things like the lion laid down with a lamb and both of them were alive. They're just playing catch. You're going to hear things like people are going to live longer lives. It's going to be considered cursed if your life is cut short early because Jesus will be reigning on his throne in Jerusalem. Woo, this is crazy. But Jesus is going to need a little help from his friends. And if you study the scriptures, this is what I believe it means when it says, and we shall reign with him. Jesus is going to take his most faithful of followers, those who've lived in light of his kingdom, and he is going to let them rule, reign on this earth with him. And I envision him almost giving them territories like governors to represent him by ruling over. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm already praying and claiming Hawaii in the name of Jesus. I see it now, Lord. I see it now. I wonder if that's not what Jesus is talking about. I wonder if Jesus isn't saying all the people who have attacked you or threatened you and you chose not to retaliate, I promise you I would take care of your abusers. I promise you I would take care of every corrupt politician. I promise I would take care of everybody who ever threatened you. I'll handle it. And I just want to say real quick, while we are fighting for masks, we should be fighting for meekness and in essence, fight for Morocco. Like you want a mask? I'm like, get a country. The invitation on the table is glorious. Jesus doesn't ask us to do something that he doesn't intend to take care of. And the promise on the table for the meek, it is too much for you to give it up because you have to get something off your chest and let somebody have it. I'm like, let them have it. Get what Jesus offers. Go with meekness. Go with meekness. It's the way to go. And I love the fact that Jesus doesn't ask us to do what he himself did not do. Not just in Nazareth, but you saw it even in the Garden of Gethsemane. When the soldiers come to take Jesus, Peter takes a sword out, takes one of their swords and cuts an ear off. You come after us, we're coming. And Jesus says, put that away, Peter. That is not how we do things in the kingdom. What, so I'm not supposed to? No, you're not. 
And he took it a step further, not just Calvary, not just Gethsemane, not just, you know, Nazareth and Gethsemane, but to the cross. I don't know if you knew, but Jesus had rights, and Jesus had the power to climb down off of that cross. And not just that, he had the power to vaporize everybody who was involved in his execution. I am so glad he did not prioritize self-protection. If Jesus had protected himself, we would be doomed. But meekness kept him there because the primary language of the kingdom of God is love. And when they were done doing their worst to Jesus, God said, all right, son, get up. And he rose from the dead. I'm telling you, when you practice meekness, you step into this realm where you get to see how God protects his people. You get to see how God defends his people. And Jesus experienced it over and over and over again. Meekness. Um, Jeff is going to come out. I'm going to read something really quickly. Um, one of my daughters was reading to me last night from 1 Corinthians uh, 13. Dad, can I read to you? I'm like, oh. and as she read it, I'm like, oh, this is good. Um, because love is the language of the kingdom. And I, I long for that to be true of me. I long for this to be true of the church. And as I was reading this, or she was reading it to me, I thought about you all. I thought about the church. And if this were true about us, just as Jesus' meekness changed the world, I believe he wants to use our meekness to change the world as well. And what if this were true about us? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, that the church is patient. The church is kind. The church does not envy. The church does not boast. The church is not proud. The church does not dishonor others. Even when it feels dishonored, the church is not self-seeking or self-protecting. The church is not easily angered. It doesn't keep a record of the wrongs and who those people did and on the other side of the aisle and blah, blah, blah. The church does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. The church always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And by the way, I love that it says the church always protects. It says love always protects. I thought love didn't protect. No. But do you know who love protects? It protects the vulnerable and the weak who are being mistreated. I believe the church should be the first to show up in those situations, to show up in those circumstances. But meekness is not about other people. Meekness is always about you personally, how you responded when somebody came after you. It's never about how you can't be meek for someone else. Because some of you are like, but if somebody's my family. No, this is not about your family. This is not about other people. It's about you and the invitation to be meek. And the promise on the table is glorious. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for his meekness. Thank you for his invitation for us to be meek and the way he modeled it for us. I beg you to give us humility and courage to truly face the challenges of wrestling through the kingdom and the way it clashes with some of our culture. And may the kingdom win in your church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.